Growing up in Vancouver, I've enjoyed a great career in law, then politics. Since entering broadcasting in 1981, asking questions has been my living. From the moment we first learn about death as a young child, we begin the search. Now I want to train my sights on life's biggest questions. With an open mind, I want to ask different faiths what happens after we die. Welcome to The Search. Hi and welcome. I'm talking with Randall Mark, a professor of world religions, philosophy, and thought at Trinity Western University and Simon Fraser University. He's also an award-winning television host here in Vancouver. Randall, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on, Rafe. Let's take a look at some of the religions and how they deal with the afterlife, heaven mm. and hell, and so on and so forth. You and I, I think we're growing up in basically the same faith. Uh, everybody avoid, uh, avoided telling us about Revelation because it's so ghastly. But we all have this idea of a pearly gates, heaven, and all of the rest of it. Is there any constant view of, of God and heaven amongst the religions? Any, any well, common view? The, the, there's basically two versions of the afterlife, and you can, can summarize it that. One is that you die and there is some kind of uh, you know, heaven, eternal, either in bliss or in kind of agony as punishment for the wicked and these kind of things. So it gets divided up, and then we can get into the nuances of what that looks like. The other is to say, no, there's not a, an afterlife in the sense of, of a heaven and hell. There is a cycle of rebirth and death. And so That's in one, sort of Hinduism. Yeah, yeah, the Hinduism, and so you get reincarnation. And those, those two concepts are really uh, the, the two that summarize almost all of them. Either you believe you die once, and then you move on to the afterlife, or you maybe have to come back again and redo and kind of improve and kind of move up through the levels. What about the concept of hell? There's many scholars now that are beginning to say the idea of hell has been deeply influenced by Greek thinking, for instance. The idea of the river Hades yeah. and these kind of things, the river Styx. That Dante's and Inferno. Right, and those kind of concepts. But it's not, not necessarily connected with Hebrew ideas, which is what the Old Testament was and into the New Testament. Jesus' you know, word for hell is, uh, is Gehenna, which means the garbage dump, a place of refuse, a place outside. But fundamentalists would look at Revelation. They'd see the yeah. fiery furnace and all these terrible things. Heaven uh, has the pearly gates. What's the mm -hmm. pearly gates come from? Yeah. And yet Christian faiths, except the fundamentalist ones, shy mm -hmm. away from dealing with Revelation. Well, I mean, I think the, the reason they shy away from it is a good reason. The book of Revelation in its genre is really a poem. It's not to be understood in some kind of one, two, three, four, five steps. Here's how the end times and the mark of the beast and all this nonsense that we've invented in the last hundred years that, this is a poem that was written by a, a pastor to his, and somehow now people get the idea that you have to interpret literally. And that's a very, very recent phenomenon in the last hundred years. It surprises me that Jesus didn't deal more with this. Mm -hmm. and, he, and frankly, he didn't really deal with it at all, other than well, talking about when, when, he did, my, when he did talk about house it. as many mansions and stuff. But when he did talk about hell, he talked about the, the, the fact that the religious people were most in fear of this place. He says, you are the ones, he's talking to the Pharisees, the religious people people, you're the ones who should be scared of going to this place. Not the, out, not the prostitutes and, and the tax collectors. These are the people who are getting into heaven ahead of them. Now, do you believe in reincarnation? Yes, in the sense of that's what our, um, our scriptures describe to us as the cycle of birth and death. But the objective is to get out of that. The objective is to go home. And home is where God resides. It's to merge back with God. That's what we're trying to do. But we're here because there's something we've got to get right or an experience we need to have or a task we need to complete. So we're here for a reason, but we need, and we need to accomplish that so we can go home. There is a soul, however, in your yes. religion. What happens to that soul at death? Depends, I guess, how we lived our life, right? Our soul is a piece of God that resides within us. It's a piece of Wahigru within us. So... I think if we've done what we were sent here to do, we go back home. That's the objective. If we haven't, then I guess we, it's another round at the wheel until we get it right. Let me see if I have this right. I have, I have a quote, which I'll just ask you to deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, Nanak's teachings are founded not on a final destination of heaven or hell, but on a spiritual union with God, which results in salvation. The chief ob obstacles to the attainment of salvation are social conflicts and an attachment to worldly pursuits, which commit men and women to an endless cycle of birth a concept known as reincarnation. Do I take it from that, then? You can break that cycle if you do things right along the way, and you can then go 
to wherever God is, presumably some sort of heaven. Or whatever it is. That's, I think that's why the gurus have kept it, they kept it very generic. What they said is we need to merge back with God. They told us not to worry about what that construct, what, what it is, what it conceptualizes as. Um, but the statement is correct in, in that we are on that search to merge back, to go back home. And so we need to figure out why we're here. And we were given tools to try to figure that out. And one of the tools that Guru Nanak talks about in Japji, it's the second to last verse, and he talks about having an inner fire. And that fire has to start, that's, it's, it's love. So that's what allows your soul to soften so God can connect with you and work with you on trying to figure out what it is you need to do. Delicate question, got to mm -hmm. ask it. Sure. If I convert, do I have to be circumcised? Um, yes. At my advanced age. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a st that stops a lot of uh, men right there. there. That may be a non-starter no, so right there have, for you. You have to be serious or don't, don't even get started. Let's get down to the business here. Uh, ever since one's a child, certainly in my case, I've worried from time to time, I think somewhat more intensely as I get older, about dying and what's going to happen in the afterlife, etc. And uh, doing the research I've done, uh, it is really puzzling as to where one would go to get the right answers. So I'd like to find out from you, uh, and, and, and first of all, does it vary from branch of the religion to the, to the other? Yes, and even more. Uh, different Jewish people, different thinkers, teachers, rabbis, all through the ages have had different ideas. And if you read the Bible closely, it's very clear in the Bible that there is a belief in the afterlife. It's, uh, for example, Jacob says to his sons when they're going back down to Egypt to visit the man who was Joseph, but they didn't know it. And we know that when Samuel the prophet died, he was in Sheol after he died, and he even was brought back. What's Sheol? Is that hell? It's not. I want to be very clear about that. And if you want to, if you want to find an English word for it, maybe it's the nether world. It's down. It's where we go after we die. But I want to say that's in the Bible. That's not Jewish belief. Jewish belief has evolved and grown and changed for more than 3,000 years since that was written. So there's a huge variety of beliefs among deeply thoughtful, learned, devout Jews. Now, is there the consistent notion, though, that there is an afterlife? How it's attained or what it's like? No, not even that. Not I mean, necessarily. Some Jews will believe you die, you die. Well, clearly the body dies. We know that. I think m probably virtually all religiously oriented Jews would think the soul, the spark of life, you could say the, the peace of God that's in us, that doesn't die. That's released from the body. What happens, where it goes, if you want to think in a ge kind of geographical uh, yeah. metaphor, we just don't know. You know. So I would say you turn off a light and there's no more light. The body ceases to function. It's hard to believe that the soul would suddenly extinguish. I, I come to you and I say, Rabbi, I, I like you. I like your congregation. I would like to join it. But one of the reasons I want to is I need some answers. I'm not getting them elsewhere. Right. I am going to die. We all know that. What must I do to get eternal life? Or I suppose the other way around, is there an eternal life? And if so, how do I get there? Or do you have to do anything? If there's an eternal life, wouldn't you just get it because you are a creature of God. You've but lived. I'm told there's another place to go, you see, that uh, you could go well, to where it's very warm and go to a place that's very pleasant. Well, Judaism doesn't really talk about that. And just to be really straight and clear with you, Judaism doesn't preach about a heaven and a hell. It doesn't have that idea. I would say virtually all of us believe after we die, our, our soul lives on in some form or another, maybe not individually as us anymore. Kind of you could say like the envelope that makes you, you, and me, me, might dissolve. And that, that, that soul energy might just go back to where it came from before we were born. Why is why, there just one God? The one God is because he is the one who created the heavens and the earth. And logically, and everything makes sense to have a one God. Because if we have other gods, as the Greeks did, you know, they had, for example, yeah. the God of the rain. Yeah. God of, this means the God of the rain is insufficient when it comes to food. And when it goes to the God of food, for example, he is insufficient when it comes to rain. And so on and so forth. God is... Almighty, he is the self-sufficient, he is the self-rich, he is the uni unity. All right, what does heaven look like? I keep hearing about 72 virgins or something for young men that go to heaven. I don't know why they'd want to. Even, even young women get uh, gets actually, you know, some oh, special get, treats as well. Do they? Is, is, yeah, is, yeah. Do you believe that? Oh, absolutely. The Quran explicitly says it. Men and women, they will get their rewards. 
Well, you think of the reward wouldn't be with for virgins, it'd be for experienced women. And no, not necessarily, my friend. You know <laughs> what happens there? I think it's been misinterpreted how people read that. You know, it's in some uh, they said that even the spouses themselves will be the the, the pleasant looking partners for their for their spouses. So, uh, but heaven itself is this uh, place where every human being will be bestowed and blessed with whatever he or she wishes. Is there a hell? Is there a Lucifer or a devil? We believe in, in Satan, yes, the devil, uh, and we believe also that there exists a hell. Now, what does it take to go to hell? Or do you have to do terrible things? To or? be honest with you, according to Islamic teachings, true Islamic teachings, up, uh, Muslims, we don't have a, a say to say this person is going to go to heaven or this person is going to go to hell. Of course, guidelines have been set. You know, it's like I, I give this example. The driving records here, you know, that when the people drive, they set, set certain guidelines, but it's up to the policeman to decide whether to give a ticket to a person who disobeys or not to give a ticket and give them, let them go off the hook, for example, with a warning. Uh, so, and now, of course, this is, I'm not trying to compare the policeman no, to God, no. but of course, uh, just to draw an analogy. Many Christians, including myself, grew up with the reward punishment sort of thing going. And if you were good, uh, you would go to heaven, and if you were bad, you would go to hell, and then all those sorts of things. And we have a soul, you know, the package. Is that package present in Buddhism, or is there a different approach to it? No, uh, there is no sense of you being punished uh, for things. Uh, it, it, it's, it, in a way, Buddhism is a science of the mind, as I said earlier, so that they are much more focused on the positive stuff. Like in psychology, for example, in the last uh, ha a half a century, scientists have been studying the causes of illnesses, depression. What, what causes you to be depressed, for example? Uh, what are the causes for schizophrenia and so on? But in the last 10, 15 years or so, there is a switch. They are now looking at positive psychology. So this is exactly the, uh, the methodology of Buddhism, to have a, a, a way, a road map, so that you can become a better person, that you be can become a happier person through compassion to others. Could a Christian find peace with Buddhism and still retain his Christianity? Very much so. Uh, you have Father Keating. You have uh, people like Thomas Merton in the, in the 60s. Uh, you have Father Lawrence Freeman. These are all uh, very committed uh, uh, Christians. But at the same time, they like to... Uh, uh, take aspects of Buddhism, especially meditation, because they think that meditation is a, a very good discipline that can help them towards uh, uh, inner peace.